Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. What? What is that? What are you doing? Well, it's Mike's part. Don't do that. It's Mike's part. I know what it is. Don't do that. Oh, you know what? This is bullshit. I'm sorry. This is... I don't do this, okay? I do this for a living. It's not a... It's not a fucking parlor game. Lewin, please, that's unfair to Lewin. This is bullshit. I don't ask you over for dinner and then suggest you give a lecture on the peoples of Mesoamerica or whatever your pre-Columbian shit is. This is my job. This is how I pay the fucking rent. Lewin, that's not... This is a loving I'm home. I'm a fucking professional. And you know what? Fuck Mike's part. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. And we are here on a very snowy Monday. Tommy, did they cancel school for you today? No, they never, They don't cancel school anymore because we're virtual. Uh, so I thought you got honorary snow days. No, we get nothing. No? No. Shit. I, well, they canceled school today for my girlfriend's kid. She didn't have to do anything. Yeah, they don't even can So they don't, uh, like my daughter's had school canceled today. They don't have to do any. They don't even have to go online or do anything like that. My mm-hmm. kids at school self cancel. Like they just don't show the fuck up. <laughs> like my last class of the day is supposed to have twenty seven students in, and I think I had fourteen. Wow. Like, they just are like, fuck you, I'm going out and playing. So Well, speaking of uh school, let's kick off the show by sharing your big news. What news? What news? You got teacher of the Millennium Award. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, I got an award for being uh, growth focused because I, I have like uh, I keep track of data really well on the kids and kind of implement plans to make sure that they're growing and, you know, they're reaching, reaching all the milestones they need to and turn in. You know, we have a lot of kids um, that are below grade level. And I, I try to make sure that we get as many kids to grade level or above grade level as we can. And I had a really good year with that. So, yeah, I got an award. I and thought I thought it was like your the kids you're teaching had the most growth or something like that. Yeah, so they had the so the kids in my section for the 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 grade I teach uh grew the most over this uh from August until this last round of testing they had in January. So yeah, yeah they so grew the most. So don't downplay it. You're you're the best. I got $1000 too. Really? I got $1000 and it was funny. It's supposed to be a surprise who they pick, but they did it on a Friday and I get paid on a Friday. Yeah. And I I looked at my paycheck and I was like, what the fuck is there an extra thousand dollars? <laughs> and it kind of dawned on me. I was like, oh shit, I guess I got that award. So I texted one of the girls I work with and she's like, how'd you know? And I was like, oh, cause I just got my paycheck. And she's like, oh, well we made a really nice video about you. So you're going to see me talk about it. She's like, it, it killed me not to tell you because I had to record this video like two weeks ago. And I was like, Oh uh, shit, that sucks. But did you get to see the video yet? Yeah. I'll send it to you after this. It's a, it's a, just a YouTube clip. It's really, really nice. But it's like my good friend at work, uh, my direct supervisor, the guy who's in charge of like all the math departments and my really close friend, Shay, who is the, we call them leader of student culture. Basically she's like the disciplinarian. Like she's the kid that like does like counseling with kids that struggle and then like does um, disciplinary things. So when kids do like, you know, make bad choices, she helps fix it. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. It's nice to be recognized sometimes, you know, it is, you know, it was funny though. Uh, They sent a plaque to my house and uh, it it was like in my head, I'm going like, don't, I don't want a plaque. Why? Because I don't want 
I, you could have just printed out like a nice piece of paper and put it in a frame and it would cost you eight dollars no man the the plaque is nice yeah but they got like a trophy store to make it and it's all engraved and shit and it's probably like 40 bucks just put the fucking extra 40 dollars in my check like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my mom's deal when we were growing up was uh she started this probably when i was about 14 or 15 my mom hates greeting cards so my mom would give you an extra five dollars if you were okay with not getting a card Oh, shit. I would have taken that deal as a kid for sure. Isn't that a great idea? So, like, you get $50 for your birthday and she'd be like, here's 55 because I'm not buying you a card. I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. Like, that's way better. Fucking card that, like, I throw out and, you know, until, you know, I wait till somebody's not looking and then I'm like, all right, I can trash this. Well, I got an award in 2016 for customer service and it's my company's best award, but it's a really nice award. It has the CEO's name on it. It's clear glass looking it's really nice oh yeah i got one of those for my fifth year at school they give it every five years they give you like a new thing like so my after my fifth year and i finished my fifth year and i said i was returning they gave me one it's that one is really i actually you know what i like that one i have that one in my classroom on my desk and it really is it looks like a diamond like you can see through it and it's a, it's cut glass it's beautiful but you know i still would also like the money oh tell the people what you did with the money oh i bought an apple watch yeah on ebay yeah you you message you messaged me wait did you say it's scratched yeah the one spot's a little scratched oh do you care no 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 i what i cared is i saved 190 dollars or whatever the fuck it was yeah you're like my ebay sales got over 200 or something yeah yeah, and and then you're like, so I, I'm like, of course he has some scheme going to get this watch. He can't just buy the watch. <laughs> no, I had to sell more than I was spending. So like, in my head, I'm going like, I'm still. It's like gambling. It's like I'm still up. Yeah. Like, even though I lost two hundred bucks, I made four hundred last night. You know what I mean? I'm still, I'm still in the, I'm still in the black. But yeah, you know. I like the Apple Watch a lot. I got one at a conference for free. Damn. But then I, I busted the face of it when I was moving some chairs. And it was going to cost like $400 or something insane to fix it. You just might buy a new one. Yeah. No. So I just, yeah, I was just like, forget it. So I just never got it again. I really liked it though. I don't know. The only thing I really used it for was because you get your phone text messages on the watch. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a device to let people know you're getting text messages. Because uh, I, I, w- I would get texts, and then I would look at the watch, and I'd be like, oh, look at me. I'm I'm getting texts, and, and they're on the watch. See, I wanted it for, like, I like the fact that uh, I can connect it to my phone. Yeah. And then, because, you know, I like, I, I exercise and shit. So, like, I'll, I'll, I like going running and counting my steps and seeing how far I ran and how fast I ran each mile. Like, I, I think that's really cool. But um, I also like the fact that, like, you know, um. Uh, you can control like the Bluetooth stuff with it. So like if I have my music running through a speaker from a distance, I can go be like, no, skip this track, go to another track. Yeah. I did like the health part of it too. It, it, it tracks, it tracks uh, steps and all that kind of stuff better than the phone does. That was the other thing is like, it tracks your sleeping. So that means I have to, I have to wear it to bed. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Just do it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i love the fact that that's like your fucking answer to stuff was like i come up with something and i'm like this and you're like no just do the opposite of that you're, fucking yeah. idiot. you're an idiot stop doing that <laughs> just wear it who cares yeah but no i was hyped dude you know what was really nice is uh i'll share that video with you like it was nice to see uh that was what i got mo- most out of it the grat- most gratifying thing was to see like my colleagues and people that like are above me like say nice shit about like how i do well in the classroom I think that's great. And when I got my award, they made a video for us too. And I never got to see it because they, you know, they had us backstage and they were going to bring us out after the video played. So I didn't get to see the video because we were backstage. And then they sent us a link to the video. And I was, I don't know, I was such a weirdo. I just never watched it. Uh. Like, I I guess I, I was like embarrassed or... So I, I dug through my old email recently, very recently, and I found the video and I watched it. Yeah. And they, they, they had a camera crew out on the streets of New York City, and they would just walk up to random people and be like, oh, say congratulations to 
so and so. So it's just like hot dog cart vendors and people out on the street and all that, just saying congratulations to each of us who won the award. That's kind of cool. It is. So I was like, why didn't I ever watch this? I'm strange. You're a lunatic with stuff like that, though. <laughs> I know. You really are. Like, we're, but you know what, though? I actually had the same thought when I first saw it because it's like, um, so every every time we have one of these big series of tests, um, they do them every marking period. So you really yeah. only have them three times, four times a year. And we have the day off from teaching, but we have what they call PD, like professional development all day. Yeah. And they did this early in the morning. So I got my award and I watched the video and I hardly watched the video because I had so many people texting me like, congratulations. That was so awesome. That was so cool. Yeah. You totally deserve it. This was great. And I was like, I immediately emailed the lady and I was like, you need to send me that video. I, I, I don't, I, I don't ask for much, but I need to see that because I need to send it to my mother. <laughs> like, yeah. My mom needs to see that I'm not a complete waste at this point because there was a long period of time where she was very worried that I was going to turn out to be nothing. And now I'm surprised. I'm, I never thought that about you. I, th- you know what, honestly, I think it really came after when I graduated from King's, and I went to go get my teaching certification and my GPA was too low to get my teaching cert. My mom was like, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your life? And I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Apparently, I have to go back to school and pay for it. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, I think that was kind of the turning point when, when she saw me take it on myself and be like, all right, I have to go back and get like, you know, a higher GPA. And the nice part was I was able to transfer like a hundred credits from Kings to temple and basically do it. So I, I have two bachelor's degrees. <laughs> can I have one? Yo, you can fucking take my English one all day. I have no clue what I was ever. I don't know what I ever thought I was going to do with that. You know, there's that old, uh, what's the guy's name? John Mulaney, the guy who wrote for SNL. He's like, I have a degree in English literature. He's like, I have a degree that I spent $120,000 on for a language I fucking speak. <laughs> like everyone i know everyone i know who got a degree in english literature did absolutely nothing with it no yeah it, it's it's just proof that i can follow through on some things i can write that's long it. paper that's a basically all it does and i know people that went to king's with me and got their bachelor's in english and then went and got a master's in fine arts in english and you know what they do They teach high school. They teach high school. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, hilarious. You got $200,000 in fucking loans and you're, you know, making $70,000 a year teaching fucking Romeo and Juliet. Fuck, man. Ouch. Well, I'm glad I dropped out of college when I only had a couple grand in student loans. But yeah, that was, you know, yeah, what we were talking about earlier, I am very strange with myself and I guess people, anyone I don't know, I'm very scared to talk to, or like even messaging people about coming on the podcast. I have to like, I have to build myself up to fire out a couple messages and ask people. And I don't, e- I don't even, I used to look at the messages and see who read it and who didn't and get deep down into this web of stuff, but I don't even check the messages anymore. I'm like, if they reply, they reply. If they don't, it's fine. Cause I, I just get too mental with this stuff. And, yeah, with, with I guess anything involving me, I'm just really weird about. Like, I have a new rule with Romy where she'll, she'll like, compliment me a lot. And it, it just, it, it, I get, like, flustered in a bad way. I get, like, crazy. Like, I can't handle any positive feedback. So, if I'm like, if you're going to say I look good or you love me, just say it once and then that's it. And walk away. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No direct eye contact. Walk away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always think about um, I, it, my wife and I are so close and we do really make a conscious effort to say nice things to each other. Yes. But, um, you know, she is all she always is like she thinks of the girls and taking care of the house first. So, like, I'll say things, like, that I think are complimentary in the moment where I'm like, oh, my gosh, your hair looks really nice today. Yeah. And she'll go, yeah, because I was able to take a shower and wash it. And I'm like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
she's like, well, you know, like it's just, you know, with the, between the baby and keeping the girls on virtual learning, it's, it's, it's a lot. And I'm like, I know. And I here I'm completely guilty of this. I sit in the basement from seven 45 in the morning when homeroom starts until like four 30 or five o'clock in the afternoon. Like I come upstairs to make coffee and grab a snack. Yeah. You know, and maybe play with the baby for a couple of minutes if I have off, like, you know, like a class gets canceled or, you know, I have, you know, some time in between classes and it's like, I feel terrible. Cause like, I, I try to make it like, Hey, I'm saying something nice. And sh- like, you know, our natural inclination is to be like, why, why <laughs> <laughs> do you ever try to help out and get in more trouble? Cause like I, I'm in the same situation when I'm with Romy, she does most of the work and uh, sometimes I'll try to help out. And I'm just getting in the way. You know, I'm like, oh, let me help with dinner here. And she's like, no, you're just getting in the way. Move. And I'm like, okay. Uh, no, because I will. I mean, the thing is, is I make all the dinners at home. Like, not not all of them, but like 80% of the time I make dinner. The one thing I do fuck up every time is folding clothes. <laughs> Kelly has like a really, and keep in mind that you, you've seen pictures of like my daughters are like one of them is, you know, like almost 50 pounds and you know, she's like a full three or four inches taller than her sister. Yeah. So they're in different size clothes. But when I see Evie and Ellie clothes, I just fucking fold them. And I'm like, all right, here's pants. Here's pants. Here's long sleeve shirts. Here's underwears. Here's uh, fucking socks. And I just put them all in the basket and bring them upstairs. And she literally goes, you, you realize I have to look through all of this, right? Because they wear different size clothes. Like Evie's pants are size six. Ellie's pants are a size seven, eight. Like, everywhere like you know it, it's just like i i made more trouble by actually doing the work yeah so i actually just do this now i fold my clothes and kelly's clothes and the baby's clothes and i put them all away and i leave everything that's the girls for her because yeah i, I, yeah, I, I, I do make that more work i make more work for her because like she exactly. ends up having she ends up having to open it up and basically unfold everything to see who's whose it is so. I do that, yeah, because Romy has a very specific way she wants pretty much everything done. So I'm like, I'm going to let you handle it because I cannot meet your acceptance criteria. I, I just can't. I actually fixed this like only recently. I didn't know this. I fold the towels wrong. <laughs> Did you know you can do that? You can fold the towels wrong. I, I folded a bunch of towels because like, you know, we just do all the towels at the same time. So like everybody's like shower towels all get washed, washcloths for the baby. Everything all gets washed at the same time. I fold it and I put it away. Yeah. And uh, I noticed when I went to go put them away, I was like, shit, these don't fit right. Like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So I just made another pile of towels and put them like kind of to the side. And I was like, all right, here, they fit in here like this. Kelly like opened them up and like took all of them out and refolded them. And I was like, what are you doing? She's like, you can't fold them like this. They don't fit in here. I'm like, yeah, but they did fit in there. Look, they're all in there. Yeah. She's like, they're all squished. As soon as you fucking pull one out, you pull all of them out. Like that's not going to work. You have seven year olds that have to get towels out of here. Like they pull one and they pull the whole goddamn thing down. I'm like, uh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> 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 well, props to the wives slash girlfriends because they do a lot. And yeah, Good segue here. You know, this is week two of me being a single parent. Yes. And I love that. I'm just going around to everyone saying I'm a single parent now. How's it working out? Great. We're pretty chill. You know, uh, she's in her room doing her thing. I'm in Romy's room doing my thing. Our room, I guess I should say. And I work during the day. I make breakfast. I make dinner. Lunches. You know, you just put a sandwich together. Everything's good. You know, it's it's a lot of pressure, though, because, like, she had her boyfriend over here one day. Yeah. And so I got to, like, keep an eye on things, you know, make sure there nothing weird is going down. Yeah. And I get worried when she goes out, you know. So we just we just play interference. I, I'm pretty lenient, you know what I mean? I, I let her pretty much do what she wants, unless it comes down to safety concerns. Yeah. Like, today, she was like, hey... It's snowing out. It's snowing out a lot right now. Yeah. And she was like, hey, I want to go meet up with my friend to get coffee. I was like, uh... I was like, did you see outside? And she's like, yeah. But, and I was like, we got to ask your mom about this one. I'm yeah. sorry. 
And she's like, but she's going to say no. And I was like, well. well then that's the fucking right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, forget it then. And I was like, you know, cer- I, certain things I got to run by the mom because her, her safety is number one concern to me. Oh, yeah. And it's like, yeah. uh, how she, she's 14, right? 14, 15? Yes. 14. So, f- she's at that age where her entire kind of outlook I know, again, I don't know her personally, but like when I was 14, my entire thing was to let's see what I can get away with. And it kind of speaks to what you just said, which is like, I'll ask him and see what he says. <laughs> and yes. if he says, yes, I'll fucking go. Because that's I know exactly if, what it is. Because yeah. I know if mom was here, she'd be like, shut up. <laughs> You're not doing that. <laughs> like, have you looked outside? Like, I think that's what. I'm kind of the most fearful of as like my kids get older is I think about what I did when I was 15, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way I'm letting them get away with the same stuff. Exactly. Exactly. I, my philosophy is just don't lie to me. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to let you go s- smoke weed in the park with your friends, but just tell me what's going on and we'll we'll see if we can be to, in the middle somewhere but it's it's an extra i mean they're kids growing up in manhattan can you yeah. imi- can you imagine that no i <laughs> <laughs> me either it, it it's, like it's, it's got to be pretty crazy it's got to be like a tv show like yeah like you have friends that are like oh i went to boarding school in paris really what the fuck is that like she she goes to a pretty prestigious high school in brooklyn yeah so all of her friends are are seemingly pretty wealthy Fancy it's wild yeah. yeah it's it's wild living here man and some of the people you you rub elbows with it really is i still think of uh i think i told this on here before but there was a point in time where like anthony and i ate lunch together and like right at the same he had lunch the same time as me was another kid his grandfather was a mayor in Philadelphia. So there was two kids in the same cafeteria that both their grandfathers were mayor of Philadelphia for <laughs> an extended period of time. I was like, Oh shit. Like this is kind of crazy. Like there's, there's some real money in this fucking room right now. So, uh, a friend of mine passed, uh, sometime within the past few days, his name was Bill King. He was in my acting class. Uh, just a really delightful guy inappropriate sharp sense of humor he would just like he would make fun of people and it would be like so vicious i love that you know what i mean in like that old codger kind of way and it was was, he was just so much fun to talk to like really he could be like really cynical dark sense of humor and you know we love that like some of the shit we say to each other (laughs) about like dead relatives and just crazy shit is (laughs) You know, it's like our way of dealing with things. Oh, yeah. And he was just, he was just great. And there was a moment in the class I'll never forget. I didn't know, I didn't know what acting was or how to do it, really. You know? Yeah. I I, I learned, there was this particular night where, I don't know, I just thought everyone on stage was not getting it right and kind of low energy. So I was really hamming it up. And just trying to keep the scene moving and pump some energy into it. But it came off really like, you know, at, at, at like the break, I went up to my friend and I was like, how am I doing? Like, what? he's like, bring it down a notch. Yeah. So I don't know. I just figured it out that night somehow with, through the combination of the teacher and this scene with Bill. Uh, we were doing this scene where I was really pissed off at him, right? Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to go nuts. Like Al Pacino, over the top, screaming throwing things it's going to be the most impactful thing ever and you know it's going to be crazy everyone's going to love it and i don't remember how i got to this point exactly i'm sure it was some intervention from the teacher i'm sure it was just working with bill we ended up going the complete opposite in the scene and doing a really subdued sadder more brooding version of it okay and it came off like 20 times more impactful that's awesome. And afterwards, I remember Bill said to me, he's like, now that was fucking acting. That's like, fucking rad, man. Yeah, and this guy has been had been acting for decades. And I'll never forget that scene for as long as I live. And oh. he, he like holds me 
in part of it and i'm like crying and i i'm like patting his arm it, it's just he was just such a nice guy he was such a nice guy we were we were gearing up to do another play last year but then covid happened and the class moved to zoom and i kind of faded out after that but i don't that that play might be the only acting i ever do the stage play we did where we had yeah. audiences and stuff and i kind of look at it with you like like you with audience of one tommy you were in the band it was a thing for a couple of years and then you were like cool i'm done like i don't need to yeah i don't need to be a music guy i don't need to keep being in bands i look at acting like that i was in this play i got the lead role i i'm so happy with what i did and i'm like that's it i'm i i feel like i'm done like i, I can't quit my job and go out on auditions and like do this thing full time. I have to make money. You know, I have to, I, I I don't know. I just, I feel like I did it. And I'm, if that's it, I'm cool with it. And Bill was a part of that whole experience. And I'm really sad that he's gone and I'm really going to miss him. And, oh, here's the story. I got nowhere else to share this. So I'm going to share it here. Go. You know, uh, he, he was getting evicted from his apartment and I don't know, he owed a bunch of money, or they had to pay him a bunch of money. I don't know what was going on. They, they like, they weren't fixing his water, so his water ran from, like, May till September or something like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he didn't want to, he didn't want to tell them because they hated him. I don't know what was going on, but he got this check for a settlement or something, and he, he didn't know he didn't know how to cash it. He didn't have a bank account or something like that. And he tried to give the apartment, the check and he couldn't do it though. I don't know. He couldn't get it done. And I was like, Bill, meet me at this bank after work. I'll put, I'll deposit the check in my account and I'll write you a personal check and give that to them. And you know, we'll, we'll send them a picture of it, whatever they want. And the, I mean, the guy was, I loved the guy. So I, I was like, I don't know if this is going to be weird for taxes or what, but I'm just going to do it because yeah. I've been in this situation where you're fighting with landlords and oh, yeah. you don't know where you're going to live. And so I, I deposited the check. I wrote him the check. He got it all settled. And apparently, I guess everything was fine. I kind of lost touch with him after that, but I, I, I wanted to help this guy. And I, I think I did. And he was just, he was just a really wonderful person and I'm really going to miss him. So I just wanted to put that out there into the universe hopefully i don't know someone he knows hears it somehow or someone that knows him and uh yeah rest in peace bill king excellent human being yeah my condolences man that's he sounds like a rad dude i love people like that that you just meet and just change your life and not by doing it intentionally it's just them being them and they just have a profound impact on you it's it's so fucking awesome you would have loved him. He he had our sense of humor, like really vicious, biting, <laughs> you know. He was he was wonderful. Just there's wonderful. Not, there's not many of us out there. No. <laughs> <laughs> you ever try to make a joke like like a brutal joke in front of somebody that's not us and it just goes over like a fucking lead balloon? I Oh, all the time, yeah. I, I just I know now that like there's certain people I, especially I work with, like, even if we're like in a meeting and we're just like sitting around, my one friend, Jess is very, very funny and very like, uh, like us, not as brutal, but like very kind of like witty and tries to be like, we all try to make sure like, you know, we're all in a good place and try to make each other laugh. And I remember one time, uh, I said something like about this person that was, you know, leaving. And I was like, yeah, man. Like, are they really leaving? She was like, yeah, I think their last day is like in, in a few weeks or something like that. And I was like, well, that's whatever. Like, I don't even care. And she kind of looked at me and she's like, you know, that person like is struggling with this, this, and this. And I was like, Oh, shit. <laughs> sorry. Like, I didn't mean to be, I don't want to, like, I never want to hurt somebody's feelings, like making a joke, but there's also a kind of a part like that, like, kind of like, you and I do it with each other. Like we're, you know, I kept thinking while you were doing like that, you were talking about your friend, like in my head, I'm going like, he's going to fucking hit the napalm death button. Any fucking second. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's going to fucking do that right now. Cause it's like, what's the most inappropriate thing you could do at this moment. And it's like, <laughs> yo, we've, we've talked about that. Remember you said when I'm doing a, 
what is it when I'm doing the intro and like everything has to be perfect? Your your inclination is to just fuck it up somehow. Oh my god, it's the same thing as like when I go to I I always think about like if I'm at like a big performance. Like I was at one of my daughter's uh, dance recitals, and all yeah. like all I think about like when I'm in there is like, what if I just got up and was like, blah, 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 like make make a big scene and like make a bunch of noise or like just scream something sh- like really inappropriate, like. I don't know why, but there's part of my brain that immediately goes there. Like when I'm in a, I've, I've always, every time I'm at a funeral, I always think like, what if I just push the casket over? Oh God. I know it's a horrible thought to have, but it's like, it's the instant my brain gets in that situation. I'm always like, what's the worst possible thing I could do right now? Like I, I do that too. I think it's a endless black hole of attention seeking, Oh yeah, you know, and I I used, I used to just say really weird shit or try to make things about me. And I remember I was at like a work meeting, and my my director was there, and someone on the board of directors. And I I remember getting up. I was like, oh, I should get up and just do a really exaggerated trip and fall over this chair and like <laughs> slam into the door. And then I was like, what? what are, are you-, you crazy? Like, no, don't do that. I. I, so this is, I I will make this short, but I went to, I went to grade school with a kid who transferred in, in like third grade. And you know, like going to Catholic school, they make you go to church at least once a week. At at some point in time, you are in church, you are in the church in, in mass, whatever you're practicing for something, whatever it is. Right. And this kid transferred to our school and he had uh, Tourette's and he did not have any really bad verbal tics his things were more like um he would do like repetitive motions with his hands um yeah. really like or he would he cleared his throat constantly and uh there was a guy that played for the phillies i forget his name jim eisenreich i think came to our school and talked about having tourettes he had the same thing where he had like these facial tics that he would do over and over again and he was like, you know, some people's Tourette's is they yell things out that are like inappropriate and blah, blah. And as soon as we heard that, me and this other kid, Sean, looked at each other and we're like, he can yell things out and not get in trouble. So we would prompt him to say really horrible things. <laughs> like when, we were, when we would be like, they would do like that silent Bible meditation where they would like read a passage and then ask you to think about it for like silently for like two minutes. And <laughs> We would just like get this kid to be like, fuck shit ass cock. <laughs> and I don't know why I thought it made me fucking laugh so hard. And they were like, you know, they automatically made the, you, he can't help it. So don't laugh. And it's like, you know, when you're not supposed to laugh and the only thing you can think about is laughing. Yeah. It was, it, that moment where like, I was literally like convulsing because I'm trying not to like actually laugh out loud and I'm trying to hold it in and I'm doing a piss poor job of it. Like, (laughs) and and it was just constant. Like, and he finally ended up transferring out of our school and I remained friends with him for a while. And I remember him being like, Hey, you guys were the first people at school that were like really nice to me. And I'm like, really? Like, dude, we just, you know, you're a nice kid. And you would skateboard with us sometimes. And I, but he was like, yeah, man. He's like, people always like, you know, gave me a hard time and like tease me. And you guys kind of taught me that like, maybe it isn't such a bad thing to have this. Like I can make people laugh and I can have fun with it and, and enjoy it. And I was like, Oh shit, really? Like we, we were really just doing it because we knew you wouldn't get in trouble. (laughs) We were just dickhead fourth graders. Like, Well, that was a nice turn to that story. I was like, Oh, I'm going to take this out, but you know what? It, it ended up helping him. And we learned a valuable lesson from it. So now you can still cut it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, or we're pretty far into this thing, but Vadim Tavor is going to be talking to us later. I want to ask him about the solo record he's got coming out and catch up with him. Yeah. It's been a while, but before we do that, uh, Gary Shaw was banned from the '90s hardcore <laughs> punk emo records, CDs, tapes, and zines Facebook group for posting a pretty innocuous bernie sanders meme where he's standing with the they're sitting with the band frotus yeah and i i want to know what that's all about so i'm gonna try to call gary right now and ask him about it let me see if i can get him on the phone yeah you sent me the meme that got him banned and i was like 
I don't. I, yeah, I what they're... are they? Are they like Republicans or centrist libs or something? What's their beef? I don't know what the. Yeah, I thought there was some kind of, in, you know, like with stuff like that. Maybe there's some type of inside thing where, I don't know. I I honestly was so confused by it because it really is just that Bernie Sanders sitting in a chair. Yeah. All with... right, hold on. I'm calling Gary. Cool. You better answer. He's probably in the middle of dinner. I don't care. This is showbiz, man. Yo, he called me at midnight the other night, too. I want to know what that's about. Please What's... leave your message for Gary Sean. Dude. Gary, it's Keith and Tommy. We're on the show right now. We want to know why that Facebook hardcore group banned you for a pretty innocuous Bernie Sanders meme. Call me back, and we'll talk about it later hilarious all right we're gonna get to the bottom of that i want to know what's going on with that page i also want to talk about gary's couponing (laughs) yeah and we're gonna start up a hashtag free gary shaw or unban gary shaw i got uh in trouble with and it wasn't like even in trouble but like i got a really like serious stern message from remember that uh i was part of one called hardcore and punk merch swap yeah. And I posted a, I think it was Creationist Crucifixion, and the other one was Disembodied. And I posted these two shirts, and I posted it as $0. Like, so I wrote in the tag, or I wrote in the post, like, hey, I have these two shirts, make me an offer. And apparently that's like a big no no in this. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, so I'm supposed to just put it up at a flat rate plus shipping? And they're like, yes. You say you want fifty dollars for it, just put it up as fifty dollars plus shipping. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, why can't I negotiate with other people? And they're like, well, if you want to do that, you can start your own page. It's like, oof, holy shit! Like, got real serious real fast. I was like, I was just trying to, you know, it didn't. The shirt didn't fucking fit anymore. So I was like, all right, I might as well sell this and got fucking shit for it. I was like, Jesus, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be that serious. I guess they don't want a bidding war on the page. I guess, but I think the other thing kind of was is I think they wanted to be more like upfront about it and not like, oh, I'm entertaining all offers on this. So somebody thinks they have it and then they're like, oh, yeah, last minute somebody offered me $5 more than that. So I took it from that. That makes sense. So are you accepting of the outcome or do you have beef? Yeah, no, 100%. I immediately was like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Like I put it up there and I was like, I want $30 for the Creations Crucifixion and 35 Well, wait. Gary just called me. Hold on. There we go. Oh. Please leave your message. God for damn it. Gary Shaw. Damn it, Gary. All right. Well, let me turn my ringer on. Oh, uh, in other podcast news, we got a one star review. Yes. Let's go. You know, they didn't write anything, though. Uh-huh. Sadly, they just clicked one star. I can see it in there with all the other ones. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I want to know what their beef is. Maybe they just don't like us. Or maybe That's they're fine. It's like an ex girlfriend, or or maybe it's like another podcast who's mad at us. They're like, "I'll show these guys one star." The, we should start like a uh, remember the John DeBella Stern War they used to have. Yo, I've thought about getting into some of that, but I don't want to. It's, it's just I'm it's, I, I'm. it's not in me. Hold on, Gary's calling me. Yeah. Yo. Yo. Yo, you're on the show. What? What show? The podcast. The only show when, we have, when? Gary. <laughs> the right only, now? Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm playing in the snow with my children. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yo, you're, you're on that dad shit all the time. I love it. Yo, quick question. Why, why did that Facebook hardcore page uh, ban you just for a Bernie Sanders meme? I think they, the, like, the number one rule is no memes. Really? Come on. Who follows the rules? Come on, man. No memes? Why? No memes. Do they do they that hate was fun? It was a, a picture of that band Frodis, their last full length. They're all wearing masks and they're in like Japan or something. And Bernie was in it. I'm like, come on. Yeah, That's we're great. we're it was a nineties reference. We're gonna get something going too. Are you still banned? I d I don't think so. Wait, why'd they unban you? 
I think uh, I, I got a slap on the wrist. Oh, see, I was going to start a whole hashtag movement and everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you and Tommy want to talk about coupons for a little bit? Uh, you know, I got to run because I got to get my kids inside. We're, we're literally covered in a foot of snow. All right, have fun. All right, later. Later. There you have it, Gary Shaw of This Day Forward. He is unbanned from the Facebook 90s hardcore slash punk slash emo records comma cds comma tapes and zines <laughs> facebook group very catchy name i like it yeah jesus could you add yeah. another comma or a slash in that jeez. 90s right. hardcore punk emo records metalcore magazines seven inch record splits what it's like dude just yeah. anyway he's unbanned so uh, they have escaped our wrath but yeah i thought i thought about like all the howard stern stuff and oh it, it, i don't i honestly I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm not at, I'm not at war with anybody. Like everybody is entitled to do their own thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I actually, I, you and I have had this conversation before because I remember somebody, another podcast had posted something about a band, like maybe it was a show flyer or uh, something. And I was like, I want to comment on there and say like, Hey, if you want to check out the Northeast scene, they, we have a podcast where we interviewed this person. It was, I think it was a Dillinger thing, and we had just done the Liam episode. And yes. And you were like, no. I'm like, why? Like, I don't want to start shit with people. <laughs> like, yeah. This is going smoothly, and we're doing our own thing. Please don't start shit with people. And I was like, you know what, though? Like, in my head, I'm going, like, it's their, it's their Instagram, and I could totally see them being like, why the fuck would this person come on my Instagram to promote their thing? Like, exactly. Pro- there's there's like unwritten rules. Like if another podcast commented on one of our posts and we're like, hey, also check out our interview. Like yeah. I would delete that shit. Yeah, you know what I, I mean? Yeah. You got to respect each other's turf, which which I do. And um, yeah, you know, there's there's plenty of room for everybody. There's 8 billion music podcasts out there. Yeah, there are a lot, man. And but it's we fun- are the best. I mean, come on. This, despite that one star review, you have to admit that we think we are the best. I got hyped when you said we got a one star one though, because I wanted somebody to like be like these dudes are posers or like say some like mean shit, and it just it's just nothing. Yeah, I'm that's I'm still the, waiting for that. I'm still that, waiting for that. That's the internet though, man. Just like say something mean and then walk away. Like one star, not even comment. It's like all right, like you could at least said we suck. Yeah, tell us why. Write us, northeastscene at gmail.com, and tell us why we deserve one star. Now, we are at some amount of minutes now, so we're going to talk to Vadim Taver. Here we go. All right, we're here now with Vadim Taver. Vadim, welcome back to the show. Now, you, you joined in the middle of a conversation Tommy and I were having, and you heard Tommy talking about something. You were, you were just fielding some guesses as to what it was. So I heard nothing. I just heard, I just heard his voice. So, my guesses, my guesses so far are the following: Tommy could have been talking about a something to do with teaching or school. Um, <laughs> B, the snowstorm that is currently happening right now in Pennsylvania. C, a, a article of clothing or something else that he may have purchased at Costco. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh d uh skateboarding over the weekend um <laughs> early in the morning before anybody's there do i mention that often <laughs> ladies and gentlemen vadim Tavor is an avid listener of the podcast and you know what i love it because uh this shows that we have some recurring themes and my guess would be b the snowstorm because it's happening it's happening right now it's a hot topic However, the answer is E. Uh, Tommy was talking about a mobile game that his kid turned him onto. Yeah. Blocked so I up. guess that could tie into family. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, it was essentially daughter talk. That's cool. What, what game is it? It's called Block Doku. So it's like, it's set up like a uh, Sudoku puzzle and very much the same shapes that you would get in Tetris. But rather than the um, pieces like scrolling down and you have to place them. You're given three at a time. Got it. So, okay, I'm, I'm actually looking it up on Google Images right now. This looks interesting, actually. This looks some, like something I would enjoy. It's very fun. The problem is, is I've hit my threshold with it. Uh, I can't get above 2,000. 
and I'm pissed because they do these things where it's like, hey, unlock this achievement, and the next achievement I have to get to is get 3,000 points. And I'm like, I fucking struggle to get 2,000. Like, I, I can't even imagine getting three. Like, when I got two, I was, like, so hyped. And then now it's like... Let me ask you this. Yeah. Let's say that your daughter beats your high score. Are you one of those people that's going to go crazy trying to beat her score because... You can't oh, no. have her be. <laughs> oh no! I'd be so hyped that she was good at it. That I get, I get so excited when they're like into stuff. It, it's almost like uh, I get weird with it. Like when I get uh, like e- Evie's really into Legos right now, and I consistently will just make time to be like, let's play Legos. And I don't get competitive with stuff, but I really want the, to encourage the things that I know are like productive. And, uh, cause no one ever did that with me. Everybody was like, you can do whatever you want. Like nobody paid attention. So I was always like, you know, fucking skateboarding taught me a lot, but like most of the time it was like, all right, at least he's out of the house, not in here bothering us. Oh shit. I was going to say something and now I forget. Is it about Costco? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of you though, when I pass Costco now, I don't have a membership. Yeah, whenever I see Costco, for sure, that's like, I just think of Tommy so- and his pants. Well, Vadim, welcome back to the show. You know, you were one of our first guests. You were back on the show, I think you were our first guest when we took this thing remote. Now, first of all, in 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 context of the podcast, I'm glad that this global pandemic happened because it taught me to do this thing remotely like tommy were we really going to do all this in person like drive to people's houses and and do these interviews in person how the fuck would we have done that how would we be able to afford to do that i don't think we ever thought it through i was just excited when you were like yo meet me downtown i got a hotel room i was like fuck yeah let's go fucking hang out and talk to mike shaw and fucking pat from all else failed and you know that's what i was excited i didn't think past those episodes so we vadim you were our first guest when we were figuring this thing out remotely and shit, I didn't know how to do anything back then. I didn't know how to record it. I didn't know I was supposed to wear headphones. So there was no bleed over. I had to figure all that stuff out as we went along and look all this time later, now you're back and we are at the top of our broadcasting game. How does it feel to be a part of that once again? It feels great knowing that I'm not going to have to be the one that edits this episode. <laughs> did you edit your episode? I did. I edited. I edited our episode. My my first Yo, episode. How annoying is it to edit the episode? And now the episodes average around two hours, so there there's pretty much always three segments to edit. And oh my god, I hate it. It it it, it was mostly trying to line up the three different audio files because like you said it was remote but i believe you guys did it through skype or something i can't remember what it was yeah we were on so skype yeah but there was so much bleed and delay that yes. um yeah that you, you like kind of had to move things around to try to get them to line up so that the um your voice if you're talking when it's coming out of someone else's microphone or some, um, someone else's uh speakers rather um, yeah. but it lines up and it was just a nightmare cause you could only do some of it, but yeah, we were supposed to meet in person cause I was going to be home for, um, Golan and Meg's wedding. And then, um, oh, right. they, yeah, they had, they had to, they had to cancel that because it was right at the start of the quarantine. Well, you know, I'm glad that we have this system now because we're talking to people all over the world and it sounds good. It also doesn't have video, which is good. Cause I I hate looking at myself like when I'm talking to people. You know what I'm saying? Like when I'm on a Zoom meeting, I'm like, oh no, there I am. It's funny you say that. So uh, you you guys know I teach um, I teach classes online, uh, like yeah. Tommy, but uh, most of my chess classes. So there's a few kids that have gotten really wise to the whole Zoom uh, classrooms. So there there's a couple kids, and I've caught them now, where they figure out they can take a screenshot of themselves on that day, like pretending like they're sitting in front of their computer. And then they use that screenshot as the virtual background and then just disappear. (laughs) Yeah. So they're sitting there and I'm just like, you motherfuckers, like, I know you're not here, you know, but, um, 
anyway, my class isn't, it's like, it's not a mandatory school class. There's no grades or anything like that. So I, I can call them out, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really have any, any sort of significance to, to their overall education. You should be like blink right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, my new trick is I, uh, I put kids in breakout groups to do group work. And I know that in order to leave the main call and to go into those breakout groups, they have to click the thing on the screen that says join breakout group number, or whatever. And it's me just being like, all right, now I know who's not here. So-and-so, so-and-so. And I start naming kids. And then all of a sudden, because they can hear me, you're usually in the room, but they can hear me saying their name. And then all of a sudden they like, you can watch them like come over and like run in front of the screen. They're like, oh, okay. I'm no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm like, you weren't though. And I just taught this whole thing. Good luck with your group work. Bye. <laughs> but we're, we're not allowed to do that. I don't think we can we can put them in breakout rooms without having um, supervision. Yeah. So we've been told that it, it's it's not ideal, but they want the kids to complete group work. They want the kids working with each other. And we did a lot of practice of what group work should look like. And I can randomly go through each one of the breakout groups and pop in. Uh, I also now know that I can duplicate my screen like four times and I can be in all the four breakout groups at the same time. Um, it gets really laggy though when I'm running four meets at the same time. It's very, very difficult um, because it ends up taking forever to actually do something in one of the rooms because essentially what I have to do is go back and close out all the other meets because every time I go to talk, they're like, Hey, your voice is all messed up. I'm like, Oh, okay. So like <laughs> yeah. when I go to talk, like you get that, like, cause the, and then when the kids talk, they're like, Hey, like, oh, I know. it's all fucking, yeah. yeah I deal so, with that all the time. Didn't you get really excited one time? I think in one of your episodes, you were talking about when you figured out that you can get multiple monitors going and then, oh, yeah. and then cause I do, I have multiple monitors and it's the best. It's like I can't work any other way now. I need to have at least two monitors going while I'm teaching. I am at the point now where, yeah, I, so I have the other monitor. It's like a regular, like, you know, 19-inch monitor, and I just – I run all the data on that. So, like, all of their actual results from the problem sets and the exit tickets and all that stuff is displayed on there. And then my laptop runs the main – like, the actual Google Meet. Um, but, yeah, it I, I – I don't know how I was doing it before, like, because I literally would have to click back and forth between both screens. And it was like, it was a nightmare because, yeah. you know, I'm trying to like address a specific problem and I'm like, all right, now I can actually, you know, be on the screen, be on the whiteboard, drawing something and then glance over at the, uh, the data and be like, all right, guys, I'm seeing you guys screw up number four. Let's go ahead and run up. Let's go display number four really quick. Can someone present number four for me? Let's run through it together and let's talk through what are the mistakes I'm seeing. Like that's one of the things that's really, really helpful. And yeah, I don't, I think when I go back into a regular classroom, I'm definitely going to have two monitors. Are you in a, you're in college right now, right? I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm only, I'm only working at the moment. What do you do now? Like, what is the end game? Because I, I know you were going to school. I know you were doing some work with NASA at some point, which is crazy. What is, uh, what are you doing now and what is the end game if there is one? So I actually dropped out, <laughs> um, <laughs> because, um, there, there was a good reason, uh, for it. <clears throat> I guess we can get into it on the podcast. I, I didn't really, um, you know, get into it in full detail with a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I ended up, so I was going to school for about three years while working full time. I was going in the evenings. So I was, I was taking, um, part-time classes in the evenings while working throughout the day. And even while I was working, I was working multiple jobs. So I did really well. You know, I had, I had a 4.0 GPA when I went back, I had all straight A's and I got accepted to UCLA. So, uh, we had to move to Los Angeles so that I can be closer to the school because there was no way that I was going to commute from Huntington Beach where I am right now. And so I ended up going for a quarter. Now, UCLA is on a quarter system, and I was previously only used to being on semester system. So semesters are, are 16 weeks, whereas a quarter is usually like 11. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess it's technically 12, but it's it's really 11 weeks. And so 
th- the pace of it is much, much, much faster. Um, and also, if if you were going to take part time classes at UCLA for the major that I was going for, which was physics or astrophysics, it was going to take me like an additional four years or so Ooh. to finish. Um, so I decided that I wasn't going to work or I was going to work like very minimal hours while, um, going to school full time because there, there was no real other way to do it. Plus I got a bunch of scholarships and, and, um, and some grants and stuff. And part of the stipulations for the grants was that you needed to attend, you needed to have like a certain amount of units per quarter and you needed Mm -hmm. to maintain a certain GPA. Yeah. And so what happened was I just, I just couldn't keep up. I, I tried really, really hard. I was putting in as much time as I possibly could, but I also learned that as an adult, it's a lot more difficult to move at that pace because I still had rent to pay. I still had all my bills. Um, you know, I basically put my life on hold um, to do it, but I didn't, I wasn't like failing or anything like that. Like I got decent grades, but it wasn't anywhere near how well I wanted to do. And the thing that I was struggling with was just that it takes me some time to process information. And I just, I've, I've accepted that at this point in my life being 38 years old, you know, I was, I guess, 36 at that time where I need to sit, I need to sit with something before I fully grasp it, or I learn really through repetition. So, you know, when I was doing a lot of physics and I was doing like differential equations and all this stuff, like when you do the problems over and over and over and over, uh, it starts to click more and you start to recognize patterns and and that's how I was able to do well with my other classes because I was doing them part time and I was able to have a, a an extended period for preparing for exams whereas at UCLA it was just like there was no time at all to focus on anything for longer than a couple of days it's just like okay we did this now we're on to the next thing immediately and I just wasn't able to retain as much information that I liked and um, unfortunately the, the people who were younger than me, like the kids who are just straight out of high school that were in these programs, you know, like in their early twenties, 20, 21, 22, um, these kids just have brains like sponges. They can, they can just yeah. absorb all this information in a very quick period. And also at the same time, pull all nighters and, you know, like not, not do anything else. They live on campus and they just do school and then they're awake like all through the night doing all this stuff. Whereas for me, like I couldn't do that, you know, like I had to commute back and forth to my home. I still had to work a little bit. Um, I still had other responsibilities around. So anyway, long story short, it just kind of came to a decision that I had to make where I realized that I was not doing as well as I wanted to. And I was, um, going to lose my one of my scholarships or i guess they would have kept it going for another quarter or two um but i had to make that decision whereas like i guess this doesn't feel like it's the right thing for me to be doing right now because i'm not doing as well as i wanted to be doing and um yeah i just i had to make it make a really difficult decision because i had invested so much time into it but right. I don't look at it at all like a loss because I ended up taking the information that I did learn and the experiences that I've gained and I've actually been able to monetize it. Like right now I private tutor as my main source of income. Like Tommy has seen, I, I suggested an app for him that I found called Notability that I use now for my Zoom tutoring for math. And because I'm available for um, for many different math disciplines. So I do algebra, trig, uh, various calculuses, linear algebra, and then three levels physics and chemistry. Um, because I'm available for all these subjects, it's really been fairly easy for me to find clients. And I guess also there's been lots of word of mouth um, and having a good resume and things like that. So there's always this concern about not being able to keep with the amount of clients that you need to, you know, to have any sort of like st- stable income, but I really haven't had that problem. And I think I've, I've just been really fortunate where I've just, I've had a lot of like repeat students that come like semester after semester. Um, and this is all ages, by the way, like I have students anywhere from like middle school, well, actually elementary school, if we're, if we're counting chess, cause the, uh, chess is uh, started as an elementary school program. So anywhere from elementary school and then up through like third year college. And, um, yeah, so 
the schooling thing is basically just on hold at the moment. Um, I had to, I had to formally, you know, drop out, I guess, or, or I don't know how, how you withdraw, withdraw I guess. Yeah. yeah, with, yeah. Withdraw from, from UCLA. So it's a little bittersweet because I, I did really enjoy learning. Well, I still really enjoy learning, but I just, I kind of had to um, make a really difficult decision for myself. It just was not where I wanted to be in my life. It, it really kind of brought down the quality of my life. Like I was just very unhappy. I was always stressed out. I felt like I was falling behind. I was constantly upset and I needed to do something about that. And I just, I needed to walk away from it. You know, it, I know it's a cliche, but I like uh, one door closes, another opens, because and my my thought process is if I try at something, if I really, really try as hard as I can, and I, it doesn't work out, or it turns out it's not for me, then I did my part. Like, I, I really tried. I went through this when I got my project management certification. I was like, I'm putting all this time and effort into this thing. Like, if I don't get it, it's going to kill me, but... I guess I just have to accept it because, you know, I'm, I tried, I think I studied for like months and months and months and, or like this podcast, for example, I'm like, you know, a lot of my life I was like, man, I wish I was in more bands. I wish I would have did more with music, blah, blah, blah. And then this thing just kind of came up and now I get to talk to all my musical heroes every month. So, you know, it's like, I guess as long as you're putting in the effort, uh, other things come up. Yeah. And I did put in my best, you know, I did, I, I did as well as I could w- under the circumstances. And I don't really regret very many things in life, honestly, um, because there's no real point to it. You know, uh, yeah. um, you can't change the past and we all learn from our experiences. And so I don't look at it as a wash in any way. I, I, I'm very fortunate to have been given the opportunities that I've been given and I've learned from them. And now I'm on a different path in my life, which, you know, like the tutoring thing that would not have come up had I not decided to go back to school in 2015. And now it's my main source of income. And I, and I feel like I'm, it's something that I'm good at. And I genuinely enjoy helping people learn. Like there's nothing greater than being able to explain something to somebody and then having them explain it back to you and be like, yeah, like you really understand this now. And then, you know, seeing their results and their exam grades and things like that. Well, the other thing is, is that Vadim, like with stuff like chemistry, physics, uh, differential equations, like all the levels of the math that you teach, typically those are the things that people encounter in school that they struggle with the most. Uh, It's the things that are the most abstract, the things that are not as concrete and people typically need extra help. Most people need extra help with it, or at least need like what you were talking about. They need that repetition. Yeah. To, okay. So to be honest with you, the main the main things that I tutor are algebra and calculus one and and first level physics. Those are the most common ones, and for for different reasons. Algebra, I think a lot of people struggle with because that's the first time they're seeing uh, non numbers in mathematics. Yeah, you know, like yeah. when you see variables for the first time, it, it blows people's minds because they're like, "What are you supposed to do with this? This isn't math. This is the alphabet." You know, so they want to plug in numbers immediately for the variable. They want to say, "Okay, well, if this is if this a means nine, or if this b means seven, this kind of thing." But you have to kind of help them understand that the variable literally means that that it can be a a, a huge number of inputs. It could be a set of numbers. Yeah, it could. Yeah. yeah, and then for for calculus, it seems like. Uh, there's a lot of students who don't need that as part of their major, but are required to take it. For example, business majors. So yeah. business majors often are required to take calculus because calculus is what? I mean, the, the entire subject is dealing with rates of change. So anything that changes over the, over the course of some time. So whether that's like growth or decay, you know, in, in bio or whether that's movement in physics or whether that's how money um changes with time in economics. So when you get econ students, they just freak out because they just thought that math was something in the past, that they were completely finished with it. And then they have this one last math class that they have to do. And of course, calculus isn't easy, especially if you haven't done math, if you've turned that part of your brain off for a while. So then they, they just freak out. And I have to kind of like calm them down <laughs> and assure them that uh, it'll be okay. And then, you know, we have to do, we have to do some algebra review oftentimes. It is, it, it's definitely a, uh, 
it's one of those things that like you were saying with like business majors where you hear people talk about like, you know, uh, I thought I was done with math and you hit the nail on the head with like, you, you definitely, you turn your part of your brain off when you're done with math because math forces you to think in a way that you normally don't you if you think about things in terms of communication in terms of like like when you're looking at things like algebra especially like i when i teach math now it's sixth grade so it's like all right we learn things like all right um laws of exponents or uh, combining like terms and then when they start to be like okay i get this and i'm like okay so now we're going to start taking what we know, learned in like terms of solving for these equations and now we're going to start graphing them and they're like, well, I thought we were done. Like, I thought I, I know how to do this now. It's like, yeah, but now this is the application of this. This is where yeah. we go with these. And the most kids, when they get that click in between, oh, I solved this equation. Therefore, when I solve this equation, this, you know, this shows this type of line. They're like, if they get the connection between those two elements, a lot of the other stuff falls into place very naturally. But when you're starting to show kids like, okay, I have an input and an output, and that means that gives me an X and a Y, therefore I can graph these. They're like, I don't get it. Like, and it, it's really hard to kind of like get kids, especially when uh, virtually now where, you know, kids can be on their phone and I don't know, like, or kids can be, you know, have me on mute and watching TV or something. You know what I mean? Like, when you don't have that full connectedness or like when I'm in front of the kids where I can be like, let me see what your work looks like. And yeah, they don't have yeah, it. I agree, like, I agree with you 100%. The, the visual aspect is incredibly important as well as the application. And that's, that's actually, I think why a lot of my um, students are returning students because I, I make a really serious effort to incorporate visuals into my tutoring sessions. Like I'm always using Desmos. I'm always explaining what this will be used for in the future, you know, because a lot of times, like, I mean, even in my schooling, I remember doing mathematics and I was o always able to carry out the analytical procedures, but then you don't, you lose sight of what it is that you're actually doing. It's like, yeah, you're just following the steps, but what does this mean? Or, or how will this be used in the future? What is the, yeah, exactly. What is the application? What will this lead to? And, and when you explain those kinds of things, then I think it makes the, the whole process a lot easier. There's a, a really, really great math YouTube channel that I subscribe to called Three Blue, One Brown. I don't know if you've ever watched any of the guys. But the guy's name's Grant. He makes just the most beautiful, beautifully uh, animated chess videos that uh, are, are like just the best math videos I've ever seen in my entire life where I, f I feel like he has really hit the nail on the head with how to use visuals to really represent um, whatever math discipline you're doing, whether it's uh, linear algebra or multivariable calculus or whatever. I mean, he goes into all kinds of, uh, he goes into number theory and all this other stuff like complex analysis, like th things that I'm unaware of, but it it's just, yeah, it's now with technology that's available, I feel like we're at a much bigger advantage than, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. It's just, it's so easy to just find um, something that explains it to you where it'll click on the internet, you know, whereas before you didn't really have that option. And, and that's what I did, you know, when I was in school, like if I was stuck on something, I would just go on YouTube or I would, or I would just Google search whatever it is I'm looking for. And I would look up to see a bunch of different sources explaining the same thing. And you might find a few and maybe you'll watch like two or three videos that don't make any sense, but then you'll, you'll hit a fourth one and then you're like, okay, now it, it clicks. You know, you just have to find the person that explains it to you in a language that, that you understand. And, um, when I first started tutoring, I was tutoring for, uh, the tutoring center center at my college at Golden West college in, in Huntington beach. And I had drop in students oftentimes. And so what that did was actually give me a really good perspective on being able to explain things in, in multiple ways. You know, when, when you learn how the student is thinking or what they know, you can sort of take different avenues to reach the same exact conclusion. And I feel like a lot of teachers don't do that. They only know how to explain things one way, just like ve very linearly. And a lot of people struggle with that because if they don't understand something in the way you're trying to explain it and you, you make no effort to 
you know, take some roundabouts and approach it from, from different perspectives, you're never going to fully um, reach them. It's like that game catchphrase. Do you, you remember we used to play that game catchphrase all the time, like a, a really long time ago? Like, like, like you would get something on the, on the, on catchphrase and you could try to explain it to your teammates. But if you're stuck, what do you do? You don't keep repeating the same thing. You try to approach it from a different, different angle yeah. and try yeah, to get, hint, get it another way. It's the same thing. Didn't work five times in a row. Why the fuck would the sixth time work? <laughs> like, exactly. Remember when yeah. uh, Mike Shaw admitted to cheating? At yeah, playing him catchphrase? and Colin, right? Yeah. They used to, yeah. They would they would yeah. like, tell each other what they were going to say beforehand, and then that was a shocking revelation. But Mike is very competitive. But listen, if you're just joining us now, this is uh, math talk with yeah. The Dean I was and just going to say we're we're out of time. This is the uh, math podcast brought to you by brought to you by Zoom and Costco. I was waiting for Keith to hit the fucking napalm death sound. I was waiting. Yeah. You can, I, you can cut you can cut a bunch of that. Out. Yeah, you you know what? I I've taken a new approach. I I was I had the mouse over the napalm death thing, and I was gonna like bash the conversation with a sledgehammer. But but I'm like, wait, I can do whatever I want with this when it's all done. Like, now listen, one thing I want to cover real quick, uh, Vadim. Yeah. Uh, last time you were on the show, episode six, you mentioned how you were collaborating uh, with a bunch of different artists on different songs and you said something to the effect of you know at least i'm not wasting my time playing a video game now <laughs> what's your what's your beef with video games no i uh, i'm sorry it can't it came out wrong um i guess it wasn't really like how maybe i just said it poorly um <laughs> i was just i was just making a, a point that i was trying to be more productive whereas i, f- I felt like if somebody is playing video games all the time and not doing anything else, I'm I'm kind of like <laughs> dig, digging a hole for myself here. I'm um, just I'm just fucking with you. I no, I think you just no. You're right. I, you're right. I didn't. I I think it came out. It didn't come out exactly how I how I meant. I was just trying to be like super productive, and and I actually didn't watch TV or play any video games or anything like that for quite a long period. Like I would say, like at least six months. Um, wow. I just completely put it away. Um, but we, I also didn't realize that, you know, quarantine and, and the world would be so different for such an extended period of time. So right. I've, so, I've sort of relaxed on that. And like, I've, I've really kind of fallen back into my love of watching movies. I, I've put that away for a lot of years. Like when I was in school, I basically like stopped watching almost all television and movies, but now I've kind of fallen back into it. Um, uh, John Mariakis is like really, really kind. He gave me uh, his login to something that, uh, called Voodoo that he had, yeah. which, is, which is like a movie storage space essentially. And he's got like so yo, many- he probably has all like every service, like Criterion, Amazon, he does. Hulu. He does. But yeah. for his Voodoo, just the Voodoo itself, um, it has so many movies on there and such great stuff. So I've just been kind of like slowly going through. Um, a bunch of the movies on there that I've wanted to either rewatch or like he's always getting like new things with with deals that are coming out. So I'm very grateful to John for for giving me that. And then as far as video games goes, um, Keith, I don't know if I told you. So I have I I bought this thing last year called a Retro Pie. Oh, um, yeah. So it's basically like the, you know the Raspberry Pi board, and it yes. comes it comes preloaded. Uh, well, mine came preloaded with 51 emulators and then like thousands and thousands of ROMs yep. for all these Ooh. emulators, which Golan did for me a long time ago, or he had done for me on an Xbox. So an Xbox is like this big bulky thing, you know, and you have to like turn a switch and stuff with this. It's like, literally I just turn it on and then there's four USB inputs. So I just bought four of the, like the SNES style controllers. And really right. I just mess around on Nintendo and super Nintendo because after that, my video game, time has pretty much just like vanished um, right now to the to the gaming community i'll have you know that vadim and i were just texting last night and i think he's going to start zelda 2 the adventure of link i'm on the final palace i haven't brought myself to slog through it yet because i know it's going to be really hard and this is one of the hardest games i've ever played and i know he's planning on playing castlevania 2 simon's quest the only good castlevania game <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, the rest are just boring uh, side action scrollers. So v- Vadim is in it. He is in it. 
I wouldn't say I'm in it, but it's it's an additional activity that I now have for myself that I was, was kind of close. No, you're in it, Vadim. So, okay, Vadim, I it. have I have RetroPie too. Do you find that some of the games are really laggy and end up kind of like pixelated or not perfect? Like when you get to certain portions. Yeah, I haven't found that myself, honestly. Um, but yeah. I'm only playing. Like I said, I'm only playing NES and SNES, and occasionally I'll do like some arcades on the main emulator. But I mean, like NES is eight bit, so I mean, like I don't know how much more pixelated it can be as it is. Uh, <laughs> it can the- run kind of <laughs> laggy on the PC, and I noticed the USB controller is not as responsive. That's why I restored my original eight bit NES, and I'm going to start playing on that. Nice. Enjoy yeah. um, trying to get those things to work blowing into them until until you're lightheaded and then like putting one cartridge over the other cartridge lodging a pencil in between them all the different tricks that we used to do to try no to man to they put in a new 72 pin connector it's good to go and i just have to clean out the games with uh alcohol and it's all it's ready it's it is certified tested ready to go nice oh i will say this too i heard you in an episode talking about how difficult some of those night guys are in zelda 2 like the guys oh, with all the armor or whatever like yeah you know the trick to, you have to jump and then um and then like hit your sword like right as you're about to um like hit on their head but not when you press down you got to like do it when the sword hits forward and anyway I, it's hard you to jump explain, slash them in the face but yeah sometimes there's no room to jump sometimes you have no life and sometimes it's those blue guys who throw over and under daggers at you oh, nonstop. Yeah. i remember oh, yeah. those guys the zelda 2 is just like such a big fuck you to the person playing it. Like you'll you're you'll figure something hard out and you'll be like, oh yeah, I beat you, game. And then something will fly out of nowhere and just <laughs> knock you into water or lava. And it, the game's just like fuck you. Like luckily you, know. you have safe states now. So I mean that's all. It's so care. bad that I have to I have to like I'll slash a guy once, save the game, and then like slash him again save the game you know what i mean it's like it's like slash to slash that's how hard it is vadim i also want to talk about this solo album uh see what's going on with it when it's coming out how far along it is folks vadim taver is recording a solo album there's a couple singles out right now they're on spotify just search his name you can hear them are they on youtube as well for tommy yeah, I think I go through DistroKid, um, which just services basically everybody. So I'm pretty sure they're on YouTube. To be honest with you, I haven't even looked if they're on there, okay. but I'm pretty sure they are. But thank you for asking. Yeah, so when you brought up the collaborations, um, and and it's funny because I was starting them like basically right when you guys interviewed me back in, um, was it March of last year? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I was doing that just to give myself something to do and also because it's the first time that I really – had all this time to kind of learn how to use recording software. And I ended up buying a bunch of gear for myself and, and like really kind of like diving in. And it was really nice. Um, the collaboration project was just a really good learning experience to, first of all, to, to practice, um, uh, composition and layering and just like my, you know, my own, my own ability to do these things as well as of course, work with people. So I got a, I got a sense of like who I work well with or what, what kind of like work ethic people have versus like what I have and that kind of thing. And, um, I wasn't planning on, uh, starting a solo project or anything like that, but it just sort of transitioned into like, okay, after, after these collaborations were starting to wind down or a lot of them were sort of at standstills cause I've been waiting for other people for a while. And I realized like, man, I don't really like waiting for people. You know, I just like, I want to, I want to move forward in what I'm doing. So it just kind of dawned on me, well, you know, why don't I just give it a shot and just try, um, a bunch of songs myself. And then, yeah, I just, I'm really bad at promoting myself or asking for help. And so to start an Indiegogo campaign to raise funds for my record was very, very, very difficult for me to do. Um, and, and just like to post things about myself, like it, I just don't like doing that. I understand why a lot of bands have like managers and things like that, doing that kind of thing, those kinds of things for them. But I really needed to try to raise some money because 
Um, I'm only capable of doing so much on my own. Uh, I can do the songwriting. I can, you know, do the instrumentation and all this stuff, but I can't really mix. Uh, I don't have the knowledge or the equipment really to do it properly, uh, as well as mastering. And then, you know, I really want to get it pressed on, on physical formats. So it's going to, I'm going to have to pay somebody for artwork. I'm going to have to pay, um, you know, like a pressing plant to have it pressed, like to do tests and then also for shipping all of these things out. So I was, I'm very, very, very grateful for the people who have contributed to it. I mean, it, it means the world to me because, um, more than anything, uh, this is just something of like a therapy for myself. And, um, and I've, that's just how I describe it to people, but it's just 100% truth like um when i when i sit down and and i'm working on a song i just don't think about anything else um whatever other bullshit that's happening in the world or in life like i just it it all goes away and i just lose hours and hours and hours of myself into this process you know like sometimes i'll forget to eat um sometimes i'll be working for like like you know on weekends from like morning to night and um it's really just the thing that makes me happiest in life. And I kind of lost sight of that. So I'm really excited to be doing it and whether or not, you know, people like it or appreciate it. Um, I mean, I hope they do, but it's mostly just something that I'm doing for myself to kind of help me through this time. If I didn't have music as an outlet, I honestly think I would, I would, uh, have gone crazy. Like I, it's, it just, it's so important for me to have like a project and this project is very big and very ambitious and, and um, it's taken up most of my free time, which is, you know, like what I want. That's what I wanted to do. So right now um, I'm 11 songs in and they're all in various stages of completion. It's, they're not like 11 songs finished. Um, And my goal is to, to write 15 and record 15 and then, probably choose just my 10 favorites out of the 15 because i think 10 songs is pretty pretty good for a full-length album yeah you don't want to go more than 10 these days you yeah know. The, I, the 90s are over forget that double album <laughs> shit it's done seven to ten songs done i don't want to do too 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 uh make it too too long because my most people aren't even album listeners anymore anyway this is a conversation i just had with with somebody that um the album listeners are of rare breed nowadays and i i'm one of those people i'm an album listener but most people aren't doing that anymore most people just listen to playlists or um yeah or just like random uh songs that they find but they don't sit down and listen to like you know 10 songs or 15 songs by one specific artist i mean maybe sometimes but not like from what i'm understanding most people don't do that regularly so i don't do it anymore unless it's a guest we have on who i really like yeah. Like pretty much all of our guests, I listen to the whole album. Otherwise, I just fuck with long playlists. Yeah, it's I get it. I mean, I get it. Um, but I'm still an album listener uh, for the most part. You know, I do enjoy playlists and mixing things up as well sometimes. But for the most part, I sit down. Like today, I think I got through about four albums while I was uh, writing some curriculum in between my classes. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty much all it is. So as far as like a timeline goes, it's tough to say I, on my Indiegogo, I listed it as the fall <laughs> for release in November. Cause I figure I give myself like a year from the time I put up the campaign, which was on Thanksgiving. And that was mm. Mike Shaw's idea. Mike, Mike Shaw said that you should do, because, you know, Thanksgiving seems like a day of thanks, like where, where people like are, are, um, just, you know, feeling grateful and, and, um, I, I just thought that that was a nice day to kind of like approach the subject and, or just, you know, like I said, it's really hard for me to do this. So I figured that yeah. would be a good day to begin it. And so the campaign is over now, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to try to press maybe just like a hundred LPs and um, whatever ones I have left over that didn't go to the campaign, I'll just have like available online if anybody wants to uh, purchase one. Excellent. So we're looking forward to that. We've got some singles up on Spotify. Fall Down is the one I've heard. I really like it. Are you working with Richie too? Richie, uh, folks, I'm I'm uh, referencing the inimitable Richie Tabor, Vadim's brother. Um, he's yeah, he's definitely helped out with the mixing um, for a few things. He actually he mixed Fall Down, and it's I really like to be 
in the presence of a mix session because yeah. I, I hear things very specific ways. I'm very detail oriented, especially since I know like all of the layers inside out. And I, I, I'm typically uh, somebody who layers quite a bit these days. So, you know, if there's like 30 layers, it's difficult to for him to gauge like where it needs to sit in the mix. So I'm very grateful to him for being really patient with me with all of my notes that I send for each mix. As usually we'll probably go through about between five and 10 um, mixes before, you know, we land on one that, that uh, is satisfactory to me in terms of like, placement not in terms of sonics because he's really good at that with like eqs and things like that so he did fall down and then i the, the, uh, put out a song called out of phase um just just a couple weeks ago and that one um bill sullivan mixed and he he did an excellent excellent job and he did something that i've never done before which is we did a virtual uh mixing session which mm. was super super cool because he i mean he you know he works with everybody you guys had him on the show you know his resume um yes. and he he does a lot of this kind of work uh, remote where he had me like, I think we were on FaceTime together, but he has a program running on his computer where I can hear through streaming exactly what's going on. So like he doesn't have to send me a full finished mix. Like we could be listening to a section at a time and then I could be like, Oh, you know, we need to tweak this or we need to tweak that like as it's happening in, in real time without having to be there. And that was um, that was huge. And also, he works with Pro Tools, which is um, the software that I'm using. And so I can send him my entire session where I already have things like pre-mixed, like I already have things panned and already at the levels where they wanted to be. He just cleans it up and makes it sound really good with the EQs and different um, uh, plugins that I don't have. So that makes it super simple because it's already like where I want things to sit, and then we just tweak them. That's awesome. Yeah, I. that's a lesson I learned from working with Richie on my EP. I wish I would have been in the room when it was being mixed, but it was the first time I ever did an album like that where I was kind of at the helm of everything. So we went back and forth a lot. I actually, I was afraid like he hated me by the end because I had so many changes, but I guess that's just part of it. I hate, I, yeah, I have that fear all the time. Like I just feel so, that's why I want to like, whenever someone's mixing um, my stuff. I'm always like, let me pay you <laughs> like yeah. you know, a good amount because like I know how specific I am and the last thing I want to yes. piss you off. But like at the same time, this is my baby, you know, like this, this is something that's very meaningful to me and I need it to sound exactly how I want it to sound. So, and, and I think that they don't take it personally, honestly, the engineers, because ultimately they understand that they're working for you. Like, you know, they're, they're just there to realize your, what you're hearing you like your you know your vision i guess so um i think if you have exactly. to go back yeah i mean they uh, you know maybe they get annoyed they can get annoyed i'm sure but it's it's okay like i think i think it's okay because i'm pretty sure that every session is like that every session you know is going to have someone just being like four mixes before there's a there's one that is uh the final mix Oh, yeah, that's just part of it. So th this raises a good question. All the collaborations you've done uh, in the last year, any beef? Any beef? Um, yeah. No, not really. Nothing? I wish, well, uh, not like beef, but I really wish that some of them got finished that didn't get finished. There is there's a few that are just out and are uh, out, by out, I mean like they remain open. Yes. And it just kind of hit a wall either where like I'm waiting for somebody or I don't know what they're, you know, there's various reasons, but yeah, like I, I think I had like 15 open. Um, mm -hmm. and I think there, there are still like five out there that are just in the ether, like what may never get released. But the good thing about, uh, two of them was, I just said, you know what, forget it. And I just made them into songs that are going to be on my solo record. So that kind of gave me a head start because I just like used my, you know, like m my compositions essentially, and then just pretty much eliminated like the, the, the collaboration part of it from whoever I was collaborating with, because either like, you know, it just wasn't really like that big of a contribution or I just, you know, I'd, I wanted to be kind of like my own thing. That's excellent. Yeah. That, yeah. I want to learn to do what you're doing because I have two basement year songs left that I want to record and put out as a single one for sure. And, uh, Oh, do you want to name any of the five people who, uh, <laughs> did not f finish up their part of the track? 
They will remain nameless. Okay. We'll we'll talk about that after the show. <laughs> okay. Um Vadim, as an avid listener of the Northeast Scene podcast, how would you rate it from one stars to five stars? You know, we got a one star review. They didn't they didn't write what? anything, but we got a we got a one star review. Um I will give you five. I'm gonna I'm All gonna right. Yeah, I, th- I think you guys um are really on to something, you know. And now granted I'm biased because I, I, I'm good friends with you guys. And also, I don't really listen to podcasts. I'm not a podcast listener, but you guys have become part of my weekly routine. And yes. I, I, so I, nice. I, I love that it's become a part of my week. You know, I like routine. I really do. And um, when I listen to you guys, it's like I'm hanging out with you. So I love the podcast so much. I think you guys have gotten way better at it over time. Not that it was bad to start with, but you know, you've kind of, like you said, like before I had to, <laughs> I had to do the, the edits from Skype and hearing like the lag and, and hearing like other people. Now you guys, you have a system like we're on, we're using something called Zencaster. I've never even heard of this thing before. <laughs> and, um, you know, everything sounds really clear. Uh, I, I, I think you guys mentioned that in an episode two, how you, you've been told that your podcast sounds really good. And that's definitely true. It's, it sounds fantastic. Like, and you guys carry the conversations really well. It's not always just about music too. You get into other interesting things. Um, so I really enjoy your podcast and I think you guys, um, built something really wonderful from the start. Now, I don't think that you should stay super strict with your one episode a week thing. I think that like, it's awesome that you're doing it, but I feel like it might give you an, an added stress that you don't need. So maybe after a certain time, like a, you, you'll be like, you know what? It's okay to skip a week here and there, but Hey, you know, that's your thing. Oh, you're talking <laughs> to, you're talking to quadriculado. Grant <laughs> paper is never going to let this happen. He's the, he's like, we are on a system. And the thing is, is like, Keith has said that before. He's like, dude, if I was still like on drugs, this would have happened once and we would have never done it again. And I no, it, it wouldn't have happened at all. <laughs> I'd be like passed out in a basement somewhere. <laughs> but, like, but I think what's but I think what's great too is is that for me, how it's become part of my routine to listen to it. Now for you guys, it's become part of your routine to record it. You know, and and that's probably something awesome for both of you to have each okay. week, where where like you know you prep your guest and and your your questions and all this kind of thing and like just to have something it to is. look forward to as well and and i respect that so much because again like i'm saying for for me recording my own music that's such an important part of my everyday um well maybe not every day but like my weekly uh routines and just something to a project that i want to do some something that makes me feel good at the end of it you know that's kind of i imagine how it is for you guys like when you wrap up an episode you're like wow okay we got another one in the books like can't wait to share this exactly exactly and we get to do it every week and it's like the only thing that would stop me from doing weekly is if i joined a band that i was really stoked on and that took up more time but in the meantime this is really scratching the musical itch and i'm putting all my band ideas into this thing like all the samples i always wanted to use for bands that i never got to i just throw them in this show and i love that you even tried out your comedy uh routine like when you did your maynard voice (laughs) that that shit was so funny like (laughs) yeah like you gotta do more things like that it was awesome the bits always come to me like in the shower in the morning in the shower is when i reach my zen state and i i either have arguments with people like that don't exist you know what i mean or no, I have hypothetical arguments with people and win oh, in my yeah. mind. I do that in the shower or like cool ideas come to me. That's so like, hope- the, uh, there's a, I, I actually learned this not that long ago. Uh, there's a French phrase for that. Uh, it's called l'esprit d'escalier. So it means like the spirit of the staircase. It's like, so when you're leaving a party, you have that moment of like, fuck, I should have said that to this person. Like when they insulted me or they said this, right. you come up with the comeback afterwards. And it's like, it's too late at that point. Yeah, yeah, jerk store. <laughs> but yeah, like you were saying, Vadim, having a project to focus on and routine are my two biggest anchors for staying sane and productive in life. I always need a project. You know, it was the band, it was the play, and now it's this podcast. And the great thing about this podcast is it never has to end. You know, Tommy and I have already committed to making it work. Yeah. 
we can keep doing it. We can do it if we have guests. We can do it if we don't have guests. And it can just go on and on forever. So any other projects that come up are a bonus. And that's the exciting part about this new life that I'm leading. New meaning, uh, you know, not doing $150 worth of drugs every day and being in a coma. Now I have the wherewithal to be awake and alive and have the the energy, the clarity to conceive these projects and put them into effect. And that's what it's all about. It's great. I love it. That's what I live for. Yeah, absolutely. I love that too, because it's, it's a good uh, demonstration of uh, diverting your energy, you know, from, yes. from something that could be detrimental to something that is just very positive and, and something that's influential and something that's inspiring. And, um, you know, that's what art really is. You know, art is just a, it's like the creative aspect is really just the most beautiful thing because you're bringing something into the world that hasn't existed before. And you can feel good about that. Like you can feel like, that, that you've made something, you've created something. And that could be anything. It could be a podcast. It could be music. It could be gardening. It could be like engineering, you know, like making, making something with your hands. Um, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's just, I think that, that, that is like what we live for, like to, to do these things and, and to make things. So I not everybody, obviously people live for different reasons, but like, to me, like that's the most important thing in life. It so is, and I used to be so cynical, like, I was fucked up all the time, so if, I was like, anyone who does things is, like, stupid, so if people were in, like, in a bowling league, or gardening, or homemade, like, any interest, I was like, that's dumb, that's a waste of time, and I thought it was dumb, because I didn't do shit, and I've realized that those things, like you said, those are what make life worth living, yeah. and, I mean, whenever anyone has, like, some thing that they do, that brings them joy like that, you know, that's not destructive. I, I absolutely love it. Actually, I want to add one other thing too, because this is, this ties into one of the earlier questions, but about, you know, about creativity in general. So I had to teach myself how to do most of the things that I know. I never really like took formal um, music lessons or like graphic design or whatever, but like over time, like I had to teach myself how to do these things, video editing for, um, for Mm -hmm. work and things like that. So I made the cover for that last single that I released out of phase. And it's the first time I've ever created artwork for like anything that I've ever done before. And if you look on there, there's, um, there's these two, um, sign the, and, and cosine, like the, these two wave functions that are on there that I created on the math website Desmos, which is just like a graphing software and I was so proud of myself when I finished doing this because, first of all, when you're out of phase, that's basically all it means is that you just you have these two, um, in this case, audio waves that where their 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 crests or their troughs, you know, like their their peaks or their valleys, they they never match up. They're like slightly just off with each other. So I knew that I can make that visualization from using Desmos because I know that sines and cosines are essentially the same exact function, just 90 degrees from each other. So I graphed them like that. And then I also graphed like a bunch of other sign functions where I knew that I can do different colors. And I knew that if I change the period, I can have them kind of like make this like almost like rainbowish pattern. So mm-hmm. I think that, I don't know if this is true, but I want to say I'm probably the first person that's ever created an album cover from a math website that's that's <laughs> online. And I, and I was I was like so proud of myself. I was like, oh man, but no one's really going to appreciate this. So of course, now I'm talking about it on your podcast. So <laughs> if anyone sees what this, better place, people are going to know now. <laughs> and no one's still going to give a shit. But it's still like to me, I'm like, yes, I t- I took you know I was creative. Um, in not just like the musical sense, but I was able to like use an application, something that I learned from, from school or, or from my academia and then applied it to, you know, creating, uh, and a piece of art, I guess, like an image. I love that. You're just taking parts of yourself and throwing it into this thing. And and that's what it's all about. But folks, we're out of time now. So we're going to say our goodbyes to our dear friend, Vadim Tabor, Vadim Thank you for coming on the show and uh, talking to Tommy about math a lot. This is now the uh, <laughs> the podcast about corn, math, and Costco. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait. Hold on. Last thing. Did you guys both watch that Buck Cherry thing that I sent oh you? From God, yeah. yeah. No. 
the cocaine thing that he sent, like where it's like, it's just, it's snippets of Buck Cherry on stage being a complete shithead. Like he might be, I literally got chills and not good ones. Like he is such an arrogant fucking dork. Like I, 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 everything (laughs) about him just makes my skin crawl. It's embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. Like I'm embarrassed watching it. Like putting myself in that guy's shoes or even anybody else on that stage. Like this is the front man. But anyway, I got to watch that. Yeah. It just made me think of it because you said corn and you guys were talking about like corn Woodstock 99, how it hyped the crowd up and everyone was going wild and stuff. And then Did you this, watch it, this video. No, I didn't yet, but I see, I didn't watch that, but this was from, <laughs> from the same Woodstock and, and just like, it's just funny because how bad things, <laughs> how bad music was at that time. He, yeah. yeah. There, there's a part where he just starts talking about how he has cocaine and all this like he gets into like really gross detail it's very like it's it's cringy but at the same time like it's such a good juxtaposition between like that and corn is like everybody just losing their minds and um, have them being amazing on stage they ever seen the video did you guys ever see the um uh the guy playing corn with corn it's so it's so oh. dumb. He's got a corn on the cob that he uses as like sticks for a drum set. He's slapping the bass with the corn on the cob. Like it's oh it's like God. it's oh the the kick pedal is a corn is like a is like a corn on the cob. <laughs> it it's so stupid. Um but anyhow, thank you um thank you for having me on guys. It it's always a pleasure to speak with you all. Thanks everybody for listening and until next time.